So Steve Pilets is a research diver, underwater photographer, and freelance journalist currently working on a film about shark conservation. Um, he taught scientific research diving at UC Berkeley, later began photographing and filming whales, dolphins, sharks, and manta rays all around the world. And today, Steve assists shark turtle and ray biologists at Magramar as a as they tag and track migratory spe species in the Eastern Pacific. So if you think of Eastern Pacific, it's it's this coast. Um, Western Pacific is over there near Japan. So Eastern Pacific, and I think a lot of what the stories that Steve is going to talk about this evening are more a little bit south of us, um, but also his knowledge is 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 worldwide, obviously. So um, with that, let me just hand it over to Steve um, at, uh, let's see, we wanted to, to Steve, did you want to talk about, yeah, why don't you put, take over for me and tell me what your plan is with the talk here. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction and welcome everyone. I want to start by asking you one question, and I hope people respond in the chat. When you think of the word shark, what are the top three words you think of? Go ahead, throw those three words you think of when you think of shark, just pop them into the chat. And I think Sarah, maybe at minute 20 or so, you know, partway through the talk, might um, we'll break it out and kind of talk a little bit about the reaction. So I think it could be interesting, we'll see what happens. Again, so with that, I'm going to share my screen and begin this tour. Now, can everyone see my screen and hear me okay? Perfect, Thumbs Steve. Up? Yeah, okay, great. So again, uh, as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna talk about shark science and conservation in the Eastern Pacific. And the Eastern Pacific is a bit, sounds a bit confusing. If you think of the ocean as the Pacific, Asia is on the Western portion of the Pacific Ocean. We, of course, the West Coast of California, but we refer to the Eastern Pacific as the Americas. And we are going to be talking mostly about the Eastern Tropical Pacific. But again, if you haven't already, please go ahead and top three words when you think of shark. This happens to be a raggy tooth shark in South Africa. And welcome. In the Bahamas, when you enter the water, this is what you sometimes see at the back of the boat. Uh, an ocean full of sharks. Some people might find this a little scary, but if you're a biologist, it's the ocean that does not have sharks that's scary. And why is that? Because sharks are super important in balancing the ecosystems they reside in. They're, to me, beautiful and powerful creatures. They've been maligned in the media. O those old enough to see the movie Jaws know how you know, sharks are made to be these vicious man eaters, but that's not so. I'll show you tons of pictures of humans and sharks coexisting. And they're, they're very critical, for example, in taking out the dead, the dying, the weak species of fish and pinniped, sea lions and seals and so forth um, out of the ecosystems. So they're like tiger sharks. They're like cleaners of the ocean. But Sharks have been swimming in the seas on the planet for over 400 million years in one, one species or another. But currently, we are killing 70 to 100 million sharks a year as per scientist estimates, and many species are threatened with extinction. But you know, sharks have these incredible superpowers. One of them, if you can see the tip of the nose of this shark, these sharks have electromagnetic sensors they're called ampullae de, of Lorenzini. And they can detect the electromagnetic field put out by every living creature. So this is useful, for example, when some sharks prey upon skates and rays that are sometimes buried in the sand. So even if they can't see the animals, they can sense that electromagnetic field. We'll talk a little bit more about that, that sensory uh, perception as well, because there are certain scientists that think the electromagnetic fields help guide these migratory sharks in moving around the Eastern Pacific as well. But they can also hear super long distances. It's true, sharks don't have ears that you can see, but they have inner ears that can sense pressure waves, just like we hear 
uh, they can they can sense vibrations of dying fish from up to a kilometer or maybe more away underwater. They also have keen sense of smell. Supposedly, they can smell a teaspoon of fish blood in a swimming pool. Um, great distances, we've experienced that in the waters. Fish blood is like chocolate cake for sharks, very enticing. And they have, like a lot of fish, a lateral line. So they have these sort of pores that also have sensory abilities to detect vibrations. Again, when a fish is dying and flopping around at long distances, these sharks can sense it in their skin, essentially. They can hear it. And then as they get closer in to prey, they can, uh, well, if they're bleeding, they can smell them. And then, of course, this electromagnetic sensory perception. So, you know, why and how are sharks so important to the ecosystems? Well, there's famous cases, for instance, in North Carolina with the shellfish industry, when fishermen overfished and killed sharks for various reasons, they taking the sharks out of the out of the water allowed skates and rays, the prey items for sharks, to proliferate or flourish. And once these skates and rays flourished, they preyed upon the shellfish. And so the shellfish industry disappeared. Similarly, coral reefs. Sharks are important in maintaining a balance in the reef areas. For example, sharks will eat what's called mesopredators, and that can be grouper, snapper, other carnivores, you know, fish that eat smaller fish. And when those mesopredators proliferate and kill off the smaller herbivores, you know, it's a problem for the coral because the herbivores eat the algae or pick the algae off of the coral. If you cover the coral with algae, it will no longer be able to, you know, pick nutrients out of the water or it's essentially hosting organisms that photosynthesize and that will no longer happen. And lastly, sharks actually eat uh, nitrogen rich organisms in the deep ocean. And then when they poop in the coral reef area, the shallower reefs, they're providing nutrients to that ecosystem. So here, I just want to share with you a few beautiful sharks from the Bahamas where the waters are crystal clear and the light is good. So for example, the tiger shark, it's pretty clear how it gets its name, those stripes, but these are gorgeous animals. They can be 10 to 15 feet long. They're also kind of known as the garbage you know, cleaners. They'll eat almost anything. I've seen them at Cocos Island eating birds. Um, they'll eat you know, fish, sea turtles. Uh, they're really interesting. And what's, what's better than one shark? Two. Um, this happens to be a shark that's well known to some of the divers in the area at Tiger Beach in the Bahamas. On the left, it's uh, a shark known as Jitterbug. Less friendly name is Butthead, um, given the cleft in its sort of fore area. This is a bull shark. And I've picked the tiger and the bull to start just to show you, you know, we're in the water with these sharks all the time. They're not attacking us. They're not man eaters. They're just, you know, fish with, well, very big teeth, certainly. Beautiful Caribbean reef shark, lemon shark. You can see some of the pores behind the eyes. And then the largest shark or largest fish in the ocean currently, the whale shark. These can be 45 feet long, can weigh over 20 tons. Uh, they're filter feeders, they're harmless, eat plankton, small fish eggs, but their mouths can be four to five feet wide. I had the experience of getting kind of run over by one from behind uh, in Mexico. And of course, the great white that many of us around here know of, um, incredibly efficient predators. Generally in this area, of course, the Farallons and the surrounding areas, they love you know, elephant seals, sea lions, harbor seals, big juicy prey items. But humans and sharks can coexist. This is a Nat Geo photographer next to me in the Bahamas, the tiger shark. You know, the boat operators say, don't use your wrist strap on your camera because the sharks can and will sometimes bite the camera and drag it off. They'll usually let it go, but you certainly want, wouldn't want to be tethered to your camera if that shark decides to explore. 
but they're curious. I mean, they don't have arms, so they're like dogs. They'll use their nose or their mouths to explore things. This diver on the lower right is probably six foot two, so gives you a sense of the size of this tiger shark. They're huge and beautiful. This is a picture of me taking a film of a great hammerhead, and these can be 20 feet long. Beautiful creatures. You know, the eyes, of course, it's obvious why they're called hammerhead. Their eyes are at either end um, of their head, and they're really good at seeing in all directions. They move their head side to side. They can really keep an eye on everything. Okay, so despite the fact that sharks are not intentionally man-eaters, when you see these silhouettes, you know, a surfer on the left, sea turtle, sea lion, you can understand a shark below will be looking up at the surface and see these silhouettes. Certainly a surfer, potentially a swimmer, could look like favored prey, AKA a sea turtle or a sea lion. So it's not a mystery to see why these uh, ambush predators like great whites, tiger sharks can come from below. And unfortunately, there are times when humans are mistaken for these more delicious items. So around the entire globe, um, many years there are five or 10 fatalities due to sharks, you know, humans. And, you know, maybe 50, maybe 80, 100 incidents. Um, most of them are not fatal. And again, five or 10 can prove to be fatal. Typically, the shark will let go of the human, but unfortunately, people can bleed out. Um, but again, to put it in perspective, you know, there's, of course, 8 billion people on the planet, hundreds of millions of people in the ocean. And globally, you know, year round, there's probably billions of ocean entries. And so these numbers are minuscule. And if you compare, again, five or 10 humans killed by sharks with 70 to 100 million sharks, you know, slaughtered by humans, it's really clear who the predator is. Just to back up a step about my background, um, yeah, I grew up in California, spent my days as a child body surfing in Southern California in La Jolla. So my first research expeditions occurred way back when, when I was five, I learned to body surf and then beach comb and watching what washed up on shore every morning at 7 a.m. We'd see sharks, we'd see jellyfish, we'd see guitar fish. And I thought it was fascinating. So from a young age, I was fascinated by what we would see at the beach. And now friends and I, including the sauna people on this, on this call, um, swim outside the Golden Gate. So along Land's End in San Francisco, you know, from Ocean Beach all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge, this area is kind of our home base. It's a gorgeous place. We see sea lions and harbor seals, pelicans, dolphins sometimes. Um, and from the deck, we see whales. It's, I haven't seen a whale while I'm in the water. Uh, but it's a, you know, every week people swim three to six times. Sometimes we'll kind of uh, pilot the kayaks as safety boats for our swimmers on longer swims, cross the Golden Gate, swim through the arches off Ocean Beach. And I, after all these years, I'm still beachcombing. So uh, unfortunately, leopard sharks sometimes wash up. Uh, humpback whales, this one, both of these were on Baker Beach. That whale was possibly malnourished, possibly a victim of a boat strike. There's a lot of, of course, shipping traffic that comes in the Golden Gate. And it's very possible it was hit by a boat. The body was rather decomposed. I can't tell what was the cause of death of that, that individual. Um, in the, wow, going back to the 1980s, showing my age, um, I took and then taught the research diving class at Berkeley. Uh, the gentleman on the far left in the yellow rain slicker, Lloyd Austin, was our dive officer. 830 divers were trained. 130,000 dives were logged, no deaths, no significant injuries, um, incredible dive program. You know, we sort of learned mostly safety techniques, but also some research techniques. And then I've been diving in the California's kelp forests, you know, for years, thousands of dives here. We took the kelp forest for granted. You know, beautiful day, this happens to be at Point Lobos in Carmel area, sea nettles, sea lions, 
as you know, on the Mendocino coast, bull kelp. And of course, most of you probably in Mendocino know, and many Californians know that our kelp forests are being decimated, um, largely by the urchins, the purple urchins on the right. We had a warm water event about 10 years ago. Uh, the sea stars, including sunflower sea star or pycnopodia, um, died off in mass numbers. And these purple urchins proliferated, again, because the sea stars that were eating them were practically non-existent. The pycnopodia, sunflower sea star, which was voracious, is still practically non-existent on the California coast. It's quite sad, but tonight I wanted to talk uh, most importantly about though, the research in the Eastern Pacific and particularly the tropical Eastern Pacific. So in, and I'll explain a little more about what that is. So in 2015, I was introduced to a gentleman named Randall Arouse. He's a Costa Rican biologist and he uh, was awarded an environmental prize, the Goldman Environmental Prize uh, by the Goldman family in San Francisco. It's a $150,000 prize. Six are given out each year to kind of eco sort of environmental gorillas, so to speak. You know, people are doing great work. Randall exposed the shark finning industry in 2000. Well, I think he won the award in 2010. Not sure what year he exposed the shark finning industry to the public. Um, but I met him in January of 2015. A month later, I was on a boat to Cocos Island, which I'll talk about in a minute. But Randall is one of, I think it's 24 scientists now that are part of Migramar. It's an organization um, designed to study and conserve um, or work to protect migratory species in the Eastern Pacific. And I'm gonna speak most about tagging and tracking of sharks, but they use other um, technologies, uh, brooves or you know, baited remote underwater video systems, eDNA sampling the water to find DNA from different species in the water, and then DNA sampling, tissue sampling. There's a lot of technologies used, but again, we're gonna talk mostly about tagging and tracking. So on this slide, if you can see my cursor, here's the Galapagos. Galapagos straddles the equator, equator and is a part of Ecuador. Cocos Island in the upper, upper middle uh, is part of Costa Rica. Uh, that's 340 miles from, you know, the mainland of Costa Rica. And then we'll talk a bit about Malpelo Island and Coiba, which are part of um, Colombia and Panama, respectively. We'll come back to that slide in particular in a moment. But these scientists have proven the migration paths. Actually, I will go back to that slide. So these, this is a sort of diagram representing a few of the species of migratory sharks and turtles. Uh, hammerhead sharks, Galapagos sharks, silkies, whale sharks, tiger sharks have been proven to be migrating from the Galapagos to Cocos to Malpelo and to the mainland, and, as well as green sea turtles and leatherback turtles. So these scientists have proven that marine protected areas around each of these unique world heritage sites are not sufficient to protect these species from overfishing because they're migratory. And you know, I'll, I'll get further into it. But so they've proposed a migratory swimway or corridor, or in Spanish, migravia, to connect the Galapagos and Cocos Island. They're about 400 miles apart. And basically by agreement between Ecuador and Costa Rica, they could have a protected area to keep the fishermen out or restrict fishing all the way from Galapagos to Cocos. Now. Hey, oh. hey, Steve. I'm yes. Wondering, I'm wondering if you want to look at at a few of the uh, the, the dark thoughts in the chat for a minute. Yeah, that would be great. This would yeah. Be a great, great time. Yeah. Perfect. Good time. So, um, question to you: What do you think is the first word that comes to mind? I would, I would, I don't know. I've guessed dangerous or man-eater, <laughs> scary, <laughs> spooky. What are the? Well, what do we get? Um, the number one word that I see almost to a T, T to T is teeth. 
Oh, teeth, okay. Teeth, teeth, big, teeth. Big teeth. Almost everyone thinks when they think shark, they think teeth. Some of these folks think of you, Steve, <laughs> directly. You think of shark, they think of Steve. <laughs> um, teeth, rough, fast. Um, teeth, Steve, and eating surfer's legs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, deadly, fast, teeth, danger and beauty, great, white and scary, teeth, primitive species, surviving millennia. I like that, Paul. Um, teeth, mysterious, fast, teeth again, jaws, hockey. <laughs> All right. Um, teeth. Steve, and loans. And what was the last one? Loans. Interesting, okay. Bill. <laughs> loans. Bill, loan, yeah, like uh, shark, loans, loan sharks. Shark. Yes. There we go. There we go. Uh, danger, teeth, scary. Teeth, predator, bloodthirsty. So that I sort of read through... Um, the 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 comments here the in the chat um i definitely think mystery i'm just i think shark and i immediately think of all the questions that i have about sharks like i wish i could better understand and understand what they're thinking and what they're just more about them they just seem to be one of the most mysterious creatures so thanks everybody for your chat right. and i'll let steve respond to some of your thoughts there that's great. Yeah, and I can um, appreciate, well, a few things, but uh, I think we have a pretty well-educated audience, but certainly I know personally a lot of the swimmers in the group, and I think if you're a swimmer, there's definitely a different attitude. As scuba divers, I think we feel a little more comfortable in the water of sharks because we're frankly doing it all the time and we can see them. But on the surface, it is a little scarier. I can, I can attest to that. The times I've thought I've seen a shark fin coming at me, turned out to be a dolphin. But when you see a dolphin fin coming at you, it's hard to tell the difference. And it that's a, a visceral moment, but anyway. So, well, thank you for that. Thank you for all for the feedback. Maybe it'll be interesting at the end of the, at the end of the chat, if we see if we get any different kind of discussion. But anyway, so back to the Eastern Pacific and thank you for that, Sarah. Um, back to the Eastern Pacific. So this, um, area between Cocos Island and the Galapagos is covered underwater by a series of seamounts, and it's an underwater mountain range. Again, those these pinnacles, these mountains, essentially, do not protrude above the surface, but underneath the topography is that it's a mountain ridge, essentially, where Cocos and Galapagos are particularly tall volcanoes, essentially, ancient volcanoes. Um, but the sharks seem to follow this um, sort of ridge system and series of seamounts in their mig migratory paths. Uh, and we'll get into it a bit further, but the scientists have found that many of the sharks reside in the Galapagos or Malpelo for longer periods of time and use Cocos Island as kind of a way station, kind of an oasis on their travels through this series of seamounts. Um, and there are hypotheses that you know, they could potentially be using their um, ampullae Lorenzini, their ability to detect electromagnetic fields uh, to navigate, because often they're so deep they can't see the surface or the bottom. So how do they how do they know where to swim? So again, these little circles are underwater seamounts. Here's the Galapagos here in the lower left, Cocos on the upper right. And then interestingly, the fishing boats, um, I think I mentioned, but each country has a 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zone. And these little yellow and red dots are fishing boats. So there's in the uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, in the summers, there were up to 300 mostly Chinese fishing boats with very large ships that were refrigerator ships and the fishing boats would take squid and fish and just 
you know, pull them out of the ocean and then transport them to the big ship, the mother ship, which was refrigerated and then refuel. And so hundreds and hundreds of ships, you know, thousands of fishing hours um, without going back to shore, we just load up and it's just been cleaning these, you know, multiple spe um, species of fish out of the ocean on the edges of the um, marine protected area. And in fact, the conservationists have pointed out that while they're often fighting the fishing industry, but the they, they the marine protected areas offer some benefit to the fishing industry because having this area where these animals can survive and reproduce um, and feed safely will actually deliver more biomass to the fishermen in the long run. So sharks, as amazing as they are, are very vulnerable though to extinction because they are slow, well, many species are slow to sexually mature. And they have small numbers of pups in many cases, not all. Typically, they're born on their own in shallow protected areas like mangrove forests, for example. But they don't have parental guidance like mammals, like dolphins and whales, you know, nurse their young for a while. Sharks, you're born and you're kind of on your own. Okay, trigger warning here. We're going to see some pictures of some dead sharks. Um, and this is a fishing boat that it's amazing it even floats. Uh, but these gentlemen are putting baited hooks on long lines and putting them out to sea. The larger commercial vessels, the really sort of industrial strength long liners, those lines can be 26, mile long, 26 miles long with baited hooks placed every you know, 100 feet or so, possibly as close as 10 or 20 feet even. And this is a dock in Ecuador with these beautiful sharks. Uh, I think there's a thresher shark on the near, um, maybe a couple of those are thresher sharks. Um, but again, part of the 70 to 100 million sharks that are estimated killed per year. And this is a sort of, these are some blue sharks, at least on the right. Uh, I think this is actually a shipping point in Spain. It's interesting to note, it's not just the countries and places where the ship, where the fishing goes on, but also these sharks have to be trans-shipped, whether whole sharks, or shark fins. So shark finning is a particularly brutal process where at sea, the fishermen will slice off the fins and dump the shark back in the water. The shark will drown. Without its fins, it can't swim. And they, many species need to keep moving to pass water through their gills and gain oxygen out of the water. So this thing will basically drown and be eaten or some one or the other or both. And then millions and millions of shark fins are headed towards Asia. Again, there's companies that are shipping these things, even until recently, US airlines, um, a lot of countries are allowing for transshipment. There's a lot of international agreements about um, shipping of endangered species. There's a organization called CITES, uh, Commission for um, uh, the transport of endangered species, and it limits what can be shipped and how. Um, but many of these agreements are circumvented. And so this carnage is so sad, not just for sharks, of course, and not just for the ocean species. Remember, when you take a shark out of the water, it throws the whole system out of, the, out of balance. So it kills off ultimately many more species. But this comes at a time, scientists call the time we're living in the Anthropocene with 8 billion humans on Earth, we're doing so much damage to the planet that 1 million species of flora and fauna are projected to go extinct in the coming decades. This is an extinction rate not seen since, you know, for the last 65 million years since you know, the dinosaurs went extinct. Again, there's always extinctions, but the rate of extinction now is like the other previous five mass extinctions in the last 500 million years. So a prominent biologist, E.O. Wilson, has argued that we need to protect half of the Earth, half of the ecosystems, to prevent this million species from disappearing. You know, it's like, I mean, if you think of the systems in the ocean and on our planet, you know, we may not understand what each species, what function it serves, but it's like, if you keep pulling pieces of an engine out of the engine, even if you don't understand what that 
what that piece does, eventually the engine will break down. So our ocean systems that deliver, you know, half of the oxygen we breathe, they deliver the weather, you know, as rain um, to our lands. Um, you know, these systems will break down if we destroy the oceans and the food web, you know, is a big part of that. So back to my, exp or the expeditions by the Mi'kmaq scientists, their citizen science expeditions basically means volunteer divers can join them and participate. So we head out from um, harbor or port in Costa Rica, a place called Punta Arenas. And what you'll see along the way is a lot of fishing boats, very small boats that look barely seaworthy. On my first time to Cocos, I've been five times now, but this is what the ocean looked like. I've never seen the Pacific Ocean anywhere this flat and this calm, literally like a mirror. So it's a 36 hour trip to get to Cocos Island, 340 miles Southwest uh, into the Pacific. And when you get there, the crew anchors the boat and then immediately starts dropping the skiffs into the water. For me, it's like Christmas. I hear at 5 a.m. the anchor drop and I know I'm in this beautiful place. And this is one of our dive boats we're immediately going to start diving three or four times a day. The biodiversity and the biomass is amazing. And then one of the premier species there is the scalloped hammerhead. This is a female. Just above the gills, you can see these mating scars. The males basically bite the females and hold on as they're mating. These sharks come in close to be cleaned by barber fish. Um, the barber fish We'll see their small butterfly fish will pick parasites off the shark skin. And we're hiding behind the rocks. So here you can see in the upper right, these butterfly fish or barber fish, they're congregating in large numbers, waiting for these scalloped hammerhead to come in to be clean. And the hammerheads will slow down, turn on their sides and allow these fish to pick the parasites off their skin. And if you're lucky, this is the kind of thing you'll find at some of the pinnacles and dive sites underwater. It's not every day that we get to see this, but at the right times of year and the right days, this is what you see. It's like the sky is filled with, of course it's the water column, but it looks like the sky is filled with scalloped hammerheads. And what is the tagging all about? Well, this happens to be Randall with a GoPro on his mask and a pole spear in his hand. We hunker down behind the rocks because these scalloped hammerheads are so shy and we basically are ambushing them. Now it doesn't hurt. We poke them. It's a sharp spear tip with an acoustic tracking tag. I mean, it startles the shark for sure, but they have incredible immune systems. Those mating scars disappear in time. And of course their skin is very, very tough. So on the left, this sharp spear tip, is attached to these acoustic tracking tags. And this happens to be a uh, gentleman, Mark Stab, another volunteer diver next to me. On this trip, I just went to photograph, but he is tagged or, well, used a pole spear to attach this acoustic tag to the base of the dorsal fin of the shark. It's kind of a perfect shot. This is where the skin of the shark is the thickest. But unfortunately, this spear tip bounced off the shark skin. And it's interesting, the shark skin is made out of a kind of a bony tooth-like material. They're called dermal denticles. And it's they're essentially scales, but they're made out of enamel or bone-like bone material. So they're incredibly tough. This is a tiger shark. I think it's Todd Steiner is another member of Migramar uh, going after a tiger shark. This is... Um, Really grainy photo of me uh, going after a tiger shark. This is my third try and successful try to tag a tiger. And you can see this plume of bubbles behind me. Um, I was, it's not the ideal way to tag a shark, but the tigers will kind of move along the bottom, patrolling slowly. This is about 115 feet of water. Um, and it's just cruising along. I was able to catch up with it and tag it. And so when we put those digital tags or acoustic tags on the sharks, these are receivers, this about a foot tall um, cylinder 
And this receiver will receive the digital signal or the acoustic signal sent out by those tags on the sharks. So every time a tag shark goes by, this piece of equipment will capture that information. So you can tag a shark in the Galapagos and here in Cocos Island, where there's about eight receivers scattered around the island um, underwater, uh, this will record what shark, again, what tag um, uh, passes what receiver. And there's a database of the tag numbers. And on in that database, there's a recording. What kind of shark was it? Was it a Galapagos shark? Was it a, a silky or hammerhead or tiger? And where was it tagged? And whatever else, if people can tell what sex the shark was. This is the skiff after a successful tagging effort. And then this is a woman from the Georgia Aquarium. Her name is Katie Lyons. She and another woman, Lisa Hoops, were tagging sharks boat side. This is another way of doing it. It is um, a, not the happiest of days for the sharks, but they are unscathed, released after they're caught and brought boat side. And what's interesting about this is you can see your kind of lasso on the tail. When you turn these sharks upside down, belly up, they um, enter a state called tonic immobility. And essentially it's like they're anesthetized. So they stop thrashing around and splashing and the uh, scientists can then uh, do their workups. So you can measure the shark, check the sex, see if they're sexually mature, take blood samples and make a small one inch incision and insert an acoustic tracking tag. In the case of sharks that reside closer to the surface, they can also put a satellite tag on their dorsal fins. Here I'm holding on to the back end of the shark. Uh, when we release them then, you have to take this sort of lasso off its tail. And I got my own very own little shark tattoo on my forearm, getting whipped by the tail. And these guys, the two on the left are Migramar scientists. Alex Hearn and Todd Steiner. On the right is Joachim Odelberg, who's a uh, photojournalist and media personality from Sweden. And Mission Blue is another organization that is working to make people aware of the plight of migratory species and these biodiverse hotspots. So Cocos Galapagos, these are all marine reserves. They're also typically UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Sylvia Earle on Mission Blue um, have made these hope spots. And she's trying to bring attention to these places. And actually she has a champion for each spot. So Cocos Island, Randall's a champion of the Cocos Hope Spot. Uh, Alex Hearn back here on the left is the champion for the Galapagos. In the middle, Todd Steiner is champion for this Cocos Galapagos uh, swim corridor or Migravia. Again, back, back to this map, showing the various patterns of shark migration through these islands. And the purpose of this, these scientists have been instrumental in creating the individual marine protected areas around these, ocean, these islands, but they've also pushed for larger reserves and now successfully for these uh, swim corridors, these migravias. All these pings, the slide is fairly confusing, but each dot is a, is a satellite ping, essentially, of typically um, a shark where they have a satellite tag put on their dorsal fin, and they can track the different species. Each color is a different species of animal, turtles, sharks. Again, it's kind of like a heat map, hard to, to see, but these triangles are, again, these seamounts underwater. You can see Galapagos here, the lower left, and Cocos on the upper right, and then um, Malpelo over on the far right. And this is the, for about 10 years, these scientists were pro proposing this large swimway uh, connecting 400 mile distance from the Galapagos to Cocos. And then they were also promoting um, a swimway connecting Malpelo Island, of Colombia to Coiba of Panama. And in both cases, they were successful. In 2021, the climate change conference, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Panama, uh, and Colombia announced that these quote unquote ocean highway, migravia, you know, swimway 
were established and it included 500,000 square kilometers of protected area, a huge, huge area and a great success. And again, there's multiple people have been pushing for this, but these Mi'kmaq scientists, this small group of, I think now 24 scientists, is really responsible for a lot of the science that proved the need for these expanded protections. Another great success, I'll be a little more brief about this, in Mexico, um, some of the scientists, including ones at UC Davis, uh, Peter Klimley, James Ketchum, Mauricio Hoyos Padilla, he's a Mexican biologist, proved that sharks were migrating amongst the islands of the archipelago uh, of Revilla Hijedo. So these four islands, Roca Partida, Socorro, San Benedicto, and Clarion, each had a small protected area. The problem was the sharks would use, for example, Roca Partida, which you'll see in a minute, to hunt, feed, and mate, and then San Benedicto or Socorro Islands to birth their pups, and they'd migrate between the islands. And so if you allow fishing between these smaller protections, again, it's game over for the sharks and the fishermen were having field days, but now there's a massive protected area around the whole archipelago. Just to put it in perspective, again, at the bottom right of the slide is Galapagos, and there's Cocos, but at the far upper left is the Ravia Hijedo. That one's 240 miles, roughly a 24 hour boat ride south of Cabo. So in 2017, uh, the Mexican government established this 57,000 square mile uh, reserve around the entire archipelago. It was a huge success. And again, many people were responsible, but the Migramar scientists were uh, instrumental as well. I've been to Rivia Hijedo two times. Um, it's also an incredible dive place. These are very wild, strong currents, incredible biodiversity. This is Mauricio Hoyos Padilla, it's another citizen science dive trip, basically means volunteers can go along and help out. And, you know, Mauricio in this case would be taking blood samples, tissue samples of the shark. You try and keep it out of the water for only like seven minutes. Uh, he'd surgically install a acoustic tracking tag and the shark goes back in the water. But again, this is Roca Partida. It's 60 to 70 miles from the nearest island. And it's about 100 feet tall at the highest point, about a football field wide at the surface. And it's really a rock column that arises from 250 feet deep. Um, the ocean floor there is very shallow. I mean, the ocean is thousands of feet deep in the surrounding area. Here at the base of this rock, it's about 250 feet deep. In this picture, I'm, you know, underwater looking up at the school of fish. I'm probably in 100 feet of water. And there you'll find all species of sharks, Galapagos sharks, whale sharks. This is one I was filming. I think I saw one of the people on this um, on this Zoom call was with me, Adam Dorfman and his buddy. But I was filming this whale shark. This happens to be the back half in this frame. It's a screenshot from a film I took, um, probably a 30 foot whale shark. And I was filming it. It swam out of the blue, couldn't see anything. And all of a sudden this animal comes, swims right up to uh, Leeds Butcher and um, just makes a right turn, goes right by one of our buddies. And then I didn't even notice, but Mauricio Hoyos Padilla with his pole spear is chasing this whale shark. It looks like the whale shark's barely even moving. And then you see Mauricio come along, his bubbles going straight behind him. He's leaving a horizontal chain of bubbles, kicking as hard as he can, never caught up. Of course, it's really hard to catch a shark like that. Like that. Um, these are white tip sharks on a shelf and then giant Pacific mantas. So elasmobranchs are the name for the branch of wildlife that includes sharks and rays. And this is the giant Pacific manta. These can be 20, 18 or 20 feet across. They have unique patterns on their bellies. Here, Mauricio is taking a tissue sample. Again, it gives a little bit of a, it's like sticking it with a, needle, little little uh, shock. but uh, And also as divers, we're taking photos of these unique patterns on their bellies because uh, each pattern is unique to each individual. Scientists, when you load these into a database, 
can estimate the number of unique individuals in the population. Of course, this place has got you know, dolphins, many species of sharks. It's gorgeous. Galapagos, I'll be more brief. Um, again, in the lower left. Of course, these are all volcanic islands I mentioned. Darwin's arch, very famous rock. It's now not an arch. The middle section after millions of years dropped out. This is um, a rock formation, the Galapagos. You can dive between this cleft. It's a it's a underwater. It's about 20 feet across also between these two rocks. Leon Dormido or Sleeping Lion. These are Creole fish. Again, biodiversity is immense in the Galapagos. And of course, Darwin made these islands. Well, Darwin worked on his theories of evolution based on you know, there were sort of distinct species of turtles and birds at each of the islands in the Galapagos. Darwin studied these again: Galapagos sharks, jacks, schooling hammerheads. I think this is a green sea turtle. Marine iguanas. They warm themselves on land and then descend into at this island is 57 degree water. It's almost like our San Francisco water temperatures. Um, but nearby there's 80 degree water. It's one of the things that drives the biodiversity at the Galapagos is there's three currents from three directions, north, south, and west that feed you know, different temperatures, nutrient rich waters, upwellings from underneath um, and gives them incredible diversity. Again, now we're gonna move to Malpelo on the right side of the slide. That's part of Colombia. And if you remember the really flat, calm day going to Cocos on this trip last December to Malpelo, um, it's another UNESCO World Heritage Site reserve. One of the founders of Migramar, Sandra Basulo, helped create um, uh, an organization to protect and push for the reserve around Malpelo. But it's known for being a really wild place and it lived up to that reputation on the way out. Um, we'd eat our meals on the back deck of this boat and often there was water running down the deck. Incredibly strong currents here, gorgeous spot. Um, of course, it's tropical. Again, tropical Eastern Pacific refers to, you know, areas Central and South America, um, these same countries I've been speaking about. But it certainly rains a lot. It's not everyone's idea of a perfect vacation, but it's all the same if you're underwater. This is a calm day. We're heading down a line to a pinnacle underwater. And um, this site, well, this looks a little barren on this rock. It's, it's I think, El Monstruo, called the monster. We'll see pictures of that. But there's another one called Aquario dive site or aquarium. You can see why. Incredibly beautiful. Um, sea life, prolific. Again, jacks, same schooling hammerhead, come in to be clean. There's the same barber fish here. And what's interesting, I'm holding on with my left hand. This is where we experienced a downwelling. So again, the current is rushing past this pinnacle in a force that's enough to knock your mask off if you look sideways. Uh, but on this pinnacle, we also hit the current going sideways and then flushing down the pinnacle, pushing you downward. So it's a little disconcerting when you're starting to be, you know, moved 20 feet down unintentionally. Um, we're at, you know, 180, 100 feet deep. Um, and then you're holding on, I'm holding on my left hand, using my camera and my right hand. And to my right is a scorpion fish and a huge number of moray eels. So I'm trying to film these guys, stars of the show, and I look to my right, there's all these moray eels. And they're not harmful in most cases, but they do have very sharp teeth. And you know, I couldn't help but look over now and then to the scorpion fish and the mores, kind of try and keep my eye on the ball. Uh, this is a dive site called Heaven's Gate. We're in a cavern and I'm looking up at the divers coming down. It's a beautiful spot. So, you know, fortunately, there's a lot of momentum. It's not just the scientists I work with. Um, United Nations more globally, they've named this decade the decade for ocean science. They have sustainable development goals. And number 14, goal number 14 is to uh, conserve um, the oceans in a more sustainable way. And so uh, there's a convention on biological diversity 
And they've set goals to for each country to presumably set their own targets to get to protecting 30% of land and sea by 2030. And so many countries were far off from that, but many countries are making very good progress. And the conservation work, it depends not just on science, you know, the proof making the case for these protected reserves, but also, you know, um, staging sort of demonstrations, getting the word out, getting public awareness up to engage politicians. If the public doesn't push for something, the politicians are generally not leaders, they're generally followers. So these scientists also get involved in legal battles, political battles, uh, negotiations, both nationally and internationally. So Randall Arauz in, in Costa Rica has hosted these marches and demonstrations. This banner says sharks are wildlife. Again, in reaction to the government saying that sharks are not wildlife, you know, the government's effort to circumnavigate um, fair treatment of endangered species. So, you know, there's been these great successes in Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador. These are countries along the Eastern Pacific. But in many ways, there's a tragedy of the commons. The high seas, you know, areas of the ocean outside of these 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zones, they're pretty unregulated for the most part. Until recently, we're seeing a little progress there. But also even within the economic zones of many of these countries, you know, there's, there's this ongoing battle. You know, first there was battles around shark fishing, then around shark finning. The environmentalists were kind of winning in many cases, but then suddenly the governments of some countries have said sharks are not wildlife. So that's a step backward. And I asked these scientists, well, how do you stay positive with all this carnage going on? And, you know, over and over, I've interviewed each of these 24 people and over and over they say, well, we celebrate the small wins, we brace ourselves for the setbacks and we just have to keep fighting. It can be grim at times, but it's a super fun effort. Um, and, you know, it takes a huge amount of commitment. These people have committed their lives to this effort. So what are the next steps for them? Uh, they are committed, uh, uh, one effort of many in their strategic plan is to um, identify and monitor and come up with management plans for coastal areas where shark nurseries and turtle nesting beaches are. You know, often the local fishermen, the locals know where these nesting beaches are for turtles. There's definitely efforts by environmentalists to protect um, you know, these beaches from poaching, from dogs, from predators on land. Um, but identifying a comprehensive plan along the Eastern Pacific, there's not necessarily the best protection for some of these nurseries and nursing or nesting beaches. So Migramar scientists have sort of put this on their radar. The next steps they'd like to identify, monitor, take some baseline measurements of what's going on and then propose protections for these coastal areas. Whereas historically it's been these more remote islands. If you don't protect these little baby turtles like that one on the left or the baby scalloped hammerheads on the right near this mangrove forest, you know, there's it's gonna be game over for so many of these species. So again, to recap a bit, there's a lot of really sad effects that humans have had on the planet. Um, but the good news is there's still plenty of things we can do. It's not too late to turn the tides. You know, by being here tonight, by supporting the Noyo Center, you know, making yourselves more aware, um, talking to your families, your friends, you can volunteer, get involved. You can sponsor good not-for-profits, good mission-driven organizations or ocean orgs. You know, by educating ourselves and our friends and family, we can get closer to a place where political gains can be made. In this US, for instance, there's legislation that comes up recently, Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act uh, in the US, where again, it making it illegal to trans ship um, shark fins and or you know to sell and and trade shark fins, even if they weren't caught in the US. We can also pressure and shame other governments. For instance, there can be import bans from you know, fisheries 
in countries where you know it's lawless and there's not um, decent environmental protections. Um, we can also reduce our consumption. You know whether it's fish, some any seafood, uh, meat, fossil fuels, plastics. We can reduce our consumption. You know anything we buy typically it's shipped over the oceans. And you know, anytime there's more boats on the water, there's more chances of whale strikes, you know, or ship strikes on whales. We can also eat fish lower on the food chain. You know, it's healthier. Typically, sardines or anchovies have less toxics like mercury in them. Um, you know, as you get to the top of the food chain, apex predators like sharks, tuna, swordfish, they're bioaccumulating, you know, they're getting higher concentrations of mercury and other toxics as they move up the food chain. So, you know, Monterey Bay Aquarium has a seafood watch, maybe Noyo Center does too, but what kinds of fish you can eat um, that are coming, coming from sustainable fisheries. So some of this might sound kind of naive, um, kind of overly optimistic, but to quote Margaret Mead, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention this evening. I'm happy to take questions if you wanna feed them into the chat and either Sarah or I can try and answer them. Again, I'm not a marine biologist, but I'm a volunteer diver, research diver. Um, but if you have questions, put them in the chat. Also happy for you to reach out. The contact information is here, but by virtue of being a member of the Noyo Center, uh, obviously you're involved, you're curious. Many of you I know are volunteers for one org or another. Um, but if you have any more interest in shark organizations, I can certainly help steer you in the right direction. As I'm sure Sarah or Trey, you know, one of the members of the uh, or the staff the Noyo Center can. So with that, I'll stop my screen share and thank you for your attention tonight. Rob, oh, that was an amazing presentation, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for taking us through that whole emotional journey from being wowed by sharks to seeing them as much more of a vulnerable species. One of, you know, it, it's really changed a lot as you took us through that and then add, adding some some hopeful bits to the to the conversation um let's see i have some things in the in the chat here um one is how effective is the enforcement within these new or older protected areas so so yeah there's rules but how goes the enforcement out there Right. So that's a really good question. So particularly with these huger and huger marine protected areas, the good news is the, the areas are great and humongous, 500,000 square kilometers. Of course, even the small protected area at Cocos Island, it used to be a seven mile radius, I think, and then it grew to 12. They have one boat at Cocos, you know, one set of rangers on that island. And guess what? I mean, you know, whatever, 10 or 10 mile radius, 20 mile, you know, diameter, that's a huge area of ocean to cover. And the good news is some of the dive boats are actually functionally the ones who can first identify illegal fishing. So it happens, these fishermen come in, they're often at the edge of the reserve, but often they'll drift into the reserve with long lines, with nets. For instance, at Ravea Hijedo, there's a very famous dive site called Boiler where all the giant Pacific mantas uh, aggregate. And imagine a place where 20 foot wide, you know, multiple thousands of pound mantas aggregate in large numbers. It's an incredible place to see. Well, that Boiler dive site was covered with fishing nets at one point. The fishermen, they'll go in and they'll poach at night. And if anyone sort of catches them, they'll just cut their lines or just take off and leave the nets to float. They become what's called ghost nets. And they can drift and just cover the environment, a rock or a pinnacle and destroy the ecosystem. You know, in that case, 
um, divers, you know, volunteer divers, researchers uh, went to try and free up, remove this netting. But policing is a huge problem. It's only going to get bigger as these protected areas get bigger. One good news is the technology. You know, many ships, including some of these illegal or, well, fishing fleets on the high seas, have, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's called transponders, but they can be seen. Um, and so there is technology to spot boats. Now, again, policing is a huge problem. I know of cases in Colombia where Sandra Basuto, I think has gotten on the radio, even I'm, I'm told with the um, Colombian Navy um, to advise them. And on at Orvia Hije though, the Mexican Navy has a presence at Socorro Island. So they can dispatch boats. But again, the chances of actually catching someone in the act is really difficult. Right. Yeah, great question though. Yeah, absolutely. And then a question, what are shark fins used for? Right, so uh, in China, uh, largely, but you know, some Asian countries, largely China, um, shark fins are used to put in soup at banquets. And so it's shark fin soup is the name. There's not a lot of flavor, I'm told, and there's not really any nutritional value. The shark fin is a very, um, I don't know how to describe it, and I'm not, I don't know the science, but I would say cartilaginous. I could be off on that. There might be a shark expert uh, on this call who could tell us, but there, it's not something you eat. It's something you stick in the soup. And it's largely, it's expensive. So it's a status kind of thing. Right. It's like, you know, Gucci this or Gucci that. Um, and so in in China, well, there's groups like Wild Aid trying to, you know, Yao Ming is a famous American, well, I guess originally Chinese basketball player who played in the NBA. There's public service ads trying to get people to not eat shark fin soup, but that's a big chunk of it. The other part, you know, people don't recognize, but there are shark products, oils and things that are sometimes used in cosmetics. And then if you're eating, um, like for example, fish tacos in many, you know, Central and South American countries, you might well be eating shark meat unknowingly. It's called fish tacos. Shark is a fish. Um, so, wow. yeah. Interesting. I, I keep wanting to pump up the urchin. If we could just put urchin into that place of, of delicacy, <laughs> like does it's way better than shark fin in your soup. Um, right. Lots of questions here. Great job. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And um, and how do I join Yo-Yo? No. Uh, I... Noyo Center. I have oh, a, oh, I don't know. Noyo. Person says S -S -P. I think that might be my daughter. <laughs> oh, sweet. Noyo. It's the Noyo Center. If she... That was a typo. <laughs> oh, oh a typo. So I... That sounds like my sister, not my, my daughter. Um, uh, but Noyo Center, N-O-Y-O -O Center, they might have put a link at the top, maybe. Um, yeah, well, we have a link link up in the chat that um, if you go back up, it's there, um, a link or just, you know, type in Noyo Center um, right. and then you can you can join, become a member, follow us on social, all the all the things. Um, definitely check up on our check out our website, um, visit us. Um, yeah. many, many ways that I hope you will, you know, I love and encourage for people to come and visit us at our new field station in the harbor at our Discovery Center um, and just peruse our, our website, get to know us. Um, and membership is makes us really smile hugely. Um, right. More, more folks saying great presentation, Steve. Um, when did you first become interested in sharks and less fearful of being in the water with them? That was Mary's right. question to you. Right. Um, right. So as a young child, I did see sharks wash up on shore in La Jolla, California. Um, and I remember being in a small boat while well, surfing or in a small boat in Mexico and seeing the dorsal fins. I was still pretty afraid of sharks at that point, which... 
I'd say I was 20 years old. But really, um, you know, when you start diving around the world, you do see reef sharks, typically small, like white tips, black tips, gray reef sharks. Those are smaller and more skittish. Um, only when I met Randall and I started going to Cocos did I start seeing my first, I think it was my second dive at Cocos, I saw a tiger shark. And I really didn't know anything about them. And on my second trip there, I volunteered to tag sharks. And I said, oh, we're going to tag tigers. And I didn't really know much. But if you do know much about, I mean, tigers, bulls, and great whites are probably the most dangerous sharks um, for humans. And um, so when they told me I was going to be tagging a tiger, and I went down the first try, fairly sizable tiger turned as I was chasing it, it, turned around and looked at me a little bit. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I thinking? So it was a it was a kind of slow progression. Seeing sharks cruising by is a common experience. My first real face-to-face, -face, I happened to kind of head off on my own when I saw this large tiger. That was my goal to tag it. And when it turned to face me, I suddenly saw those teeth and the mouth, and it was kind of intimidating. Um, but you know, over time. I, you know, then in the Bahamas, they come right up to you and you just push on their nose and, um, you know, they'll explore. But if you can push on their nose, keep your hand away from their mouths. Um, I would hold my camera in my right hand and push with my left only if they initiated, you know, contact. You'd see when they expected to bump bump you, they have what's called a nictitating membrane. It's like an eyelid, but it comes from the bottom and it's white on a uh, tiger shark in particular. And you'd see that white membrane go up to cover its eyes. They don't want to hurt their eyes. And it means they're kind of expecting to bump you. So when you see that, I kind of put my left hand up. And interestingly, if I put my left hand up, often they would not bump me. I think they'd see my hand going up and decide not to make contact. Um, but it's only after I've did, literally done thousands of dives uh, and you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of dives with sharks. Right. So you fear those things that you don't know, and as you get to know them better and better, then they they become less less of a fear thing. It's right. It's a little bit. Um, and Paul Nader is asking this or saying this is the this year is the fiftieth anniversary of the Endangered Species Act of the three hundred and fifty or so species of. Elsma Bronx, how many of them, I'm sure I thrashed that pronunciation, um, how many of them are endangered of all the sharks? And what is the U.S. government doing to protect these endangered and threatened species? Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll start by saying I don't know the answer. I don't know the number. But what I can say is um, there's a, a International Union for Conservation of nature, IUCN, and it categorizes species, and there's different categories. Um, if I had to guess, again, my pretty uneducated, I haven't looked at the numbers recently or anything else, I know I could probably name 10 species that I know of that are endangered. Now, there's a range, so that's not a zero one thing, endangered or not. It's vulnerable, it's, you know, threatened, vulnerable, near um, I think it's near vulnerable, um, and then, uh, well, critically endangered or endangered. So, and, and maybe is that Paul and in in, I see Paul now, you know, maybe he knows a better answer, but, um, there's very many, uh, species of sharks that are estimated to be 5% of what they once were, you know, it could be 5%, could be 10 and these are populations in certain areas that differs around the world. But we have decimated many, many species of sharks or small fractions of what they used to be. The categories, again, there's kind of numerous buckets of, in other words, types of approach to extinction. And every year or two, the IUCN kind of considers, it's they have appendices one and two, which species are you know, endangered, critically endangered, again, vulnerable, threatened, et cetera. So I know Paul might know more. Um, well, second part of that question, what is the U.S. government doing to protect them? Um, 
increasingly, we have a lot of, like in California and in, I think in Florida as well, but um, certainly in California, we have a pretty strong network of marine protected areas. Florida, I think it's maybe a little less um, well-regulated. I know they still have shark competitions in certain, well, parts of the Eastern seaboard, um, whereas you can't fish for sharks around here at all legally. Um, but also not just about the fishing, but also about transporting. Again, CITES, the Convention for Inter International um, Trade of Endangered Species, you know, US and others are um, signatory to these agreements and increasingly there's more and more pressure on, you know, US interest, uh, for instance, airlines and this and that to uh, avoid trans shipping of shark fins, for example. So not sure it's a great answer, it's a partial answer. Um, I know, uh, Paul, I don't know if you have more information on that, but. No, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Thank you very much, Steve. I was curious, you said you can think of 10 species. Could you just name, I mean, I don't know if the great white is considered endangered or the, the great hammerhead. Could you tell us a few names of some that are in that endangered category? Yeah, and I might misspeak, but um, the scalloped hammerheads, I think, are um, endangered, maybe even critically endangered. I'm not sure if they rank them by area. Um, I think tiger sharks um, are either endangered or in certain areas considered endangered. Um, mm -hmm. I probably can't tell you off the top of my head. I, I guess I've seen the, the names and numbers, but I really... You know, I think extracting those few names is all I can do right now. I I don't know, but I think great hammerheads might well be one of the species. Um, but I would say the resource you can easily go to is the IUCN, and they have what's called a red list. Um, and again, they have appendices one and two for creatures. It's not just sea creatures, but you can look up almost any species of shark and get the exact, because it's also a moving target over time. Right, right. I think that the success there in that question is that get us curious about sharks and want to learn more um, is, is you know, spread the word and, and talk about sharks and talk about what we've learned here. I mean, I, most of you probably picked up on the fact that those photographs that Steve is bringing to us are just one part of that to photograph and share these incredible photos of sharks, something that most of us will never I mean, a huge percentage of us will never have the opportunity to actually swim with sharks or be brave enough or have the wherewithal to take the camera with you and and capture beautiful images of these. I mean, that's just that to me just brings, you know, you're doing great work and sharing that with all of us and your photo photography and, and journalism is really spectacular. Um Heat Jay just was mentioning, uh, uh, not that I eat fish, but what are some examples of uh, sustainable fish to eat? And I do see that there are a few more questions, um, but I want to I want to try to get to them and also respect people's time. Um, examples of sustainable fish, I say eat uni. If you like that taste, eat, eat purple urchins. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know of... of really off the top of my head, actual sustainable fish. Yeah, I would again point to the um, uh, Seafood Watch is a guide. If you Google it, um, uh, put out by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I don't know if he is still on the call, but oh, I think she is. Um, uh, but Seafood Watch gives a list of very specific uh, species and where those fish come from. I think it's, right. it is very hard to know if you're at a restaurant or something, like where did this salmon come from? Where did this cod? You know, I'd say, I think cod often are okay. I mean, some of my friends still spearfish for, um, you know, black cod, blue cod, uh, well, um, kelp fish of various types. Um, and I think those are typically okay because it comes down to also partially how the fish are caught. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's rod and reel or... I mean, for sport fishing, if you've got a fishing license, um, you know, if you're outside of a marine protected area, you can, you know, go and it's not very easy to spear a fish. I can say that from yeah. 
early These long line long line black cod fishing boats with their hand hooking and and yeah. these long lines are doing it in a, in a way that they've done it for many years so they go into the Noyo harbor and or the you know if you're buying the fish directly from the fisher people who are out there catching them on hook and line i think that's you know certainly going to be better than than going to Safeway and getting fish that's caught in a big drag net sort of thing. I mean, it's, but right. yes, food washes is, is a great resource. And I think you can probably just Google that and pop up with some real current sort of information. Um, I don't want to miss anyone. Um, one by Lauren Ito, um, if I've noticed differences in sharks, the way they respond to humans, and I can answer that briefly. Um, so in these, well, the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, more and more there's dive tourism. There's good things and bad things about that. Um, the good things is the dive tourists can be, again, spotting illegal fishing in some of these remote areas. Um, too much dive tourism, of course, is not a good thing. And that's a, you know, that can happen. Revia Hedo, sometimes there'll be six or eight dive boats um, out there. That's probably too much. They're, I mean, they limit it, but Cocos, there's only one or two. Um, but for instance, the Bahamas, um, another sort of dirty secret is the tour boats, the dive boats will chum. And it's not illegal, but um, it's considered controversial. They'll, you know, pour some fish blood, chop up some barracuda, and the sharks will come in. Um, and so, and even the scientists in with permit will, I mentioned baited um, remote underwater video systems. There's a methodology where they will bait a trap. Essentially, when I say trap, it's just a, a motion detecting GoPro, essentially. But when they put the bait out, they'll see how many sharks, how many fish come, and they can make relative comparisons to the amount of sharks. But the sharks that are in the Bahamas that are accustomed to tourist dive boats chumming or chopping up barracuda, they know, I mean, they know so much that the, the dive operators have names for the sharks. And um, I mean, these guys believe the sharks know them. Um, I, I think it's clear that when they hear, and, and there's been cases of problems where the sharks might get excited thinking, oh, there's humans, where's my food? Mm -hmm. um, the boats I've been on don't feed the sharks. There's no way uh, a tiger shark can subsist if it gets one little barracuda steak in a, you know, five day period or something. It's just not gonna be a dent in their food or caloric intake. Um, but it, it may well be, I mean, their comfort level is larger because they're accustomed to seeing diver. I think there's no doubt about that. In the places that happens, it's more common in the Bahamas, um, Cocos Island, Galapagos, uh, Ravia Hiedo, I don't think there's enough humans in the water to really, I mean, that said, the, the giant Pacific mantas, I mean, I, I think we're losing part of our, our audience here, but the giant Pacific mantas literally swim over you because your bubbles exhale, rise up and tickle their bellies. I mean, they obviously love it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we do see differences and that's, you know, humans, we have to be careful about the dive tourism is true. Yeah. For sure, just like everything, too much of 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 our activities are going to cause have cause and effect on on any different species that that we um, explore. It was interesting. We we're all pretty familiar with the sperm whale that washed in, and that Steve and um, uh, one of his divers was out there and kind of got the smell as that sperm whale came in. And um, I personally saw more sharks in those in that week that that sperm whale was around that I've ever seen. They were definitely in and around and on our YouTube channel, you can see them uh, munching on that sperm whale. And often I get seals and sea lions that wash up that have encountered sharks. And there's a big, huge sea lion in the Noyo Harbor right now that had a significant bite, was allowed to rest and this massive injury actually healed up. And he's, he's, he's cruising around in the harbor. You can see him with a big shark bite couple of other of them were not that lucky but um yeah they're around and that's kind of all I see of them is their their bite marks so anywho it looks like that's a wrap but I can't thank you enough for joining us this evening 
um, really informative. I hope you'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, if you have any you know further questions, Steve shared his contact there, um, or you can go to the Noyo Center, contact Trey or I, if you have any further questions or, or anything like that. But um, thank you, Steve. Thank you for your time. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for being here and supporting Noyo Center. Yeah, thank you. And thanks uh, to you, Sarah, for doing everything that you do. And Trey, a plug for the Noyo Center. I've been up there. Mary's taken me on the tour of the Fort Bragg, uh, I guess, uh, well, information center and the one out at the um, lighthouse. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing place. So I, the Noyo Center is doing great work. I've seen a number of your science talks. So I would salute everything that you are doing and encourage people to join. Many thanks. Love your scientists, folks. They're doing great work worldwide. Thank you, everyone.